In this high-tech world of iPods, iPads, iPhones, Blackberries, and high-speed internet, why would a person continue to dedicate his life to a centuries-old instrument called the organ, or as Sir Christopher Wren once described it, a box of whistles? Well, I'm one such person, and I would be very happy to share my story. For as long as I can remember, I was drawn to the sound of the pipe organ, taken in by it, really, absorbed by it. The church in which I grew up, in Pennsylvania, had a large, old pipe organ. I can still remember the sounds and the sight of that old organ, and the smells. Pipe organs have a unique odor inside. It's a combination of old wood, leather, and the dust of the ages. But that was some 60 years ago. Why in the 21st century, as we're all surrounded by marvelous technology, would someone continue to go up alone into an organ loft often dark, sometimes dank, sometimes the bats come out, and spend hours practicing on a centuries-old instrument like the pipe organ. Well, I've already admitted to being hopelessly attracted to the sound and nature of the instrument. But there's also a human factor. That's right, a human factor. With technology these days, everything seems to be about instant access or immediate contact, a megafest for social interaction. But in my view, technology has little to do with human connection. Just watch the people fiddling with their raspberries or sea phones. It appears to be the ultimate in self-absorption, they're oblivious to those around them. Organs, on the other hand, are all about humans. The people who crafted them, with painstaking care through time-honored traditional skills, the people who play upon them, and especially the people who enjoy listening to them. Playing the organ, like building one, is a craft. My passion for the organ, however, is also about history. Being an organist allows me to be in constant touch with the past, to connect with over 2,000 years of history, and most exhilarating, to connect with Bach and others and the organs that they played in their lifetimes. What an honor this is. Every time I play a piece of organ music, I'm transporting that music, often several hundred years old, to the present day. I'm allowing it to live and communicate now. As Eric Routley put it, to cause ancient truths to be present truths. Just think of it. Imagine the history of the cells in the wooden pipes, or the bright sound of the tin in the metal pipes, all made before box time, but vibrating with music today. Computers, B-pods, D-pads, strawberries, gooseberries, all technology, become dated as soon as they're unpacked from their boxes. Organs, however, last for many centuries. I once had the honor of playing a particularly famous and large organ in the German city of Lüneburg. My teacher, 
who was once Contour in Lunebourg, at the church where Bach was once a choir boy, arranged the recital there as a special gift to me. The organ dates from 1553 and is still played every day. I remember during my practice time taking much time to listen to every pipe one at a time to instill the sound into my aural memory. But there's even more to my lifetime passion. To play on such an organ as the one in Lüneburg is to have a thing of beauty before you. The carved wood of the case, the artistically arranged pipes, the polychrome decorations, often in gold leaf, the wooden cherubs with trumpets who have sat on their perches for centuries. Sorry, but a piano is just an instrument. An organ is often a work of art. And then there's the excitement of the challenge. Unlike the good old 88s, every organ is completely different. The manuals range from two to four or more. The stops range from dozens to hundreds. Each is unique in layout, design, and sound. And so working out how to arrange the different colors and timbres of each piece is part of the challenge and takes many hours of on-site preparation. While on a concert tour, I might play the same piece on five different organs, and each performance will sound and feel quite different. And then on the road, one encounters the occasional dog. Yikes! How am I going to make music on this box of whistles? Performing on the organ is, in a way, like being a chef. Selecting just the right sound ingredients, which flutes to use, the big trumpet or the smaller one. Is the pedal sound too boomy? A box of whistles. Yes, that's how the noted architect of St. Paul's Cathedral, Sir Christopher Wren, famously called the organ being built for the cathedral by Father Smith. Wren referred to it as that damn box of whistles. Ah, but what whistles? Big ones. Some more than 32 feet tall. Others smaller than a pencil. Loud ones, soft ones, trumpets and flutes. An infinite variety, all controlled by one person. The organ at Longwood Gardens, which I play from time to time, has 10,010 pipes. The famous Wanamaker organ in Philadelphia has three times that many, with 453 stops. But of course, these two giants are not typical. Normally, when I play a recital, I make sure to use all the stops, individually and together. In the case of Longwood, better judgment prevails. I don't want to kill the audience or have the flowers outside die in the conservatory. However, it is always necessary to try out the Longwood organ's toys. Drums, cymbals, bird songs, a gong. And one can even play a grand piano, which is situated inside the organ, from the organ. And finally, there's the fun of it, of course. The console of a large organ is not unlike the cockpit of an airplane. Keys, stops, push buttons, pedals, 
and an array of gizmos, many with accompanying colored lights. Who wouldn't love that? During the summer of 2010, I had the honor of playing recitals on three large and significant organs in Scotland. Interestingly, although each was a fine musical instrument, they made a group of three contrasting instruments in personality, style of voicing, and most especially in the nature of their actions, that is, the way in which the keys control the opening and closing of valves under each pipe. The University of St. Andrews, founded in 1413, is the oldest university in Scotland and the fourth oldest university in the English-speaking world. In 1973, university authorities made the somewhat unusual decision to go to the Austrian firm of Hradetsky to build a new organ for their chapel. The result is a large mechanical action organ of four manuals. Mechanical or tracker action is the original, that is, pre-electricity system for controlling the pipes. It dates back more than a thousand years. The key that the player depresses is linked mechanically by a tracker to the valve under each pipe. This system allows the player's touch to be directly involved with the music making. Although a fine instrument, the tonal personality of the organ at St. Andrews is not what one might expect in the chapel of a major British university. It is particularly suited to playing Baroque music of the German type. The magnificent organ in Glasgow's Kelvin Grove Art Gallery was made by the London firm of T.C. Lewis in 1901. Quoting from a brochure about this organ, its tonal scheme does indeed reflect the mid-Victorian influence of French and German innovation, confidently integrated within a fundamentally British tonal structure. As the St. Andrew's organ is, first of all, an instrument for a church, the Kelvin Grove organ is classified as a concert instrument. It has the wonderful warmth and breadth of tone so characteristic of English organs. Because it is a fine musical instrument, as with the organ at St. Andrew's, one can play any type of music on it but it does a particularly marvelous job in playing music from the 19th and early 20th century. The Kelvin Grove organ, 
employs a key action that was used in the late 19th and early 20th century organs called tubular pneumatic. A maze of thousands of small lead tubes run throughout the organ, making connections between keys and the valves beneath the pipes. This system allowed for locating the organ's console at some distance from the pipes. With mechanical action, the console is directly attached to the organ case. Another unique aspect of this builder's organ is the set of combination buttons that allow the organist to make rapid changes in the stop settings with the touch of a button. For the past hundred years or so, these little round buttons are located just beneath the keyboard. They're often called thumb pistons because the most reliable way of pushing one is with the thumb of either hand. The traditional location of these thumb pistons was established by that era's most prominent British organ builder, Henry Willis, universally known as Father Willis because of the esteem in which he was held. Well, Willis was T.C. Lewis's chief rival. Lewis wished to incorporate the technology of the combination action, but didn't want to use Willis's style of thumb pistons. So he made the decision to place these in a unique location. He put them not below the keyboards, but on top of the keys, in little slats towards the back of the key. I've never seen anything like it. Needless to say, Lewis's system did not catch on. In fact, I had a difficult job to not accidentally push these while playing. The Church of the Holy Rood, that is, Cross, is the second oldest building in Stirling, after nearby Stirling Castle. Founded in 1129, the church has played richly prominent roles in British history. For example, the infant King James VI, later to be King James I of England in succession to Elizabeth I was crowned in the Holyrood Church in 1567. Bullet marks on the tower may date from a siege of Stirling by Cromwell's troops in 1651. This organ has a mechanism known as electro-pneumatic, the type that became the standard action around the world in the first half of the 20th century. Electro-pneumatic and tracker are the two standard actions used today. The English firm of Rushworth and Dreeper built this four manual pipe organ with its 80 stops in 1939. It is a beautiful and comprehensive instrument with a truly romantic sound. It is such a pleasure and great reward to play an organ on which everything sounds right.
And then there's the home organ. In 2000, I had the joy of watching the installation of the Jefferson pipe organ in Bayard Sharp Hall at the University of Delaware. In fact, the whole world had that opportunity if they wished because the process which unfolded over six weeks was broadcast live on the University of Delaware's website. Bayard Sharp Hall was built in 1843 as St. Thomas's Episcopal Church. The Episcopalians used it for more than a century and then built a new, larger building on the other side of the city. This building went through a series of uses and abuses, including a period as the Newark Town Library. The university acquired it in the late 1990s and began an extensive restoration. To UD's credit, they persevered in this extensive and expensive undertaking, later winning an award for the faithfulness of their restoration. As the project was moving along, Dr. Edward Jefferson, a UD trustee and former chair of the DuPont Company, came forward and offered to pay for an organ to be housed in what had been renamed Bayard Sharp Hall. Ed Jefferson, a native of England, had loved organ music since his days in the boy choir of a London church. Former President Roselle always delighted in referring to Ed as the university's organ donor. Because the restoration process was rapidly approaching its conclusion, and because the organ builder ideally should be a partner in such an enterprise as soon as possible, it became apparent that picking an organ builder quickly was essential. To make the long story slightly less long, I was given the authority to select an organ builder. And so the two most challenging and occasionally frustrating aspects of securing a new organ, funding the instrument, and a committee decision on who the builder should be, were settled in a flash. The Jefferson organ was built by the prominent American organ builder, Lynn Dobson. He has a small shop in a smaller and remote town in Iowa. The Jefferson organ was Dobson's Opus 74. Each organ is built one at a time by skilled craftsmen. The signatures of all those who worked on our organ can be seen prominently on one of its back doors. As it turned out, we were very glad to have signed a contract with Dobson when we did, because he went on to build the two largest organs of his career, Opus 75 
for the newly constructed Roman Catholic Cathedral in Los Angeles, and Opus 76 for the Kimmel Center, home of the Philadelphia Orchestra. This is the largest mechanical action concert hall organ in the United States. And had we not been ahead of these two in Dobson's production schedule, we might still be waiting for our organ. The only thing that's possibly better than a great gift is an unexpected great gift. After having two old pipe organs that were dismantled and removed long ago, I never imagined that the University of Delaware would have its own pipe organ again. Of course, none of those magnificent instruments of the past would have existed if it weren't for the church. During my career, I've had the opportunity and the honor of playing some very significant instruments in this country, in Ireland, Wales, Scotland, England, and Germany. And most of them have provided me with a great deal of satisfaction. But what has provided me with the most moving and thrilling moments in my career is when I've had the opportunity of leading a large congregation in vigorous, singing. For me, this is the real musical experience. I've been playing the organ in churches since 1960, some 50 years, and I love it the same now as I did then. It's what I do best. I must say, playing the organ has taken me to some interesting places. To play a recital in the oldest church in Stirling, Scotland, or to be locked in a Gothic cathedral late at night, that's the only time the visiting organist may practice. From the organ loft in the completely dark Canterbury Cathedral, I once thought I saw ghosts in the front. It turned out to be monks in white robes saying the evening office. And after dark, the bats come out in Westminster Abbey. So you see, playing the organ really is a great life. And now, if you'll excuse me, I need to get back to checking my email on my blueberry. <laughs>